Good morning. And uh, as Carolyn has mentioned, my job is basically to start you off with a, I suppose, bird's eye overview of a lot of big issues that you're going to be discussing and, and talking about in more detail over the next uh, a few days. And as I put it up here, I think I'd like to divide my talk into sort of four sections, really. Firstly, just give a very brief overview of what do I see as being the major patterns of contemporary armed conflict um, in Africa at the moment. Then, as Carolyn mentioned already, look at some of what I would consider to be the big myths out there that are trying to explain why we've seen so many wars of so many different types in Africa. And I'll focus in my talk mainly on the sort of post-Cold War, post-1990 uh, period, although we can go back a little bit further sometimes is useful. Uh, then spend a little bit of time, uh, if we've talked about the myths, just spend a little bit of time thinking about what I would see as being some of the key drivers of, uh, of conflict on the continent. And I'll flag it up right at the beginning. I think governance issues and basically good old-fashioned politics and the struggle for political power is really driving most of the, uh, the conflict dynamics that we see at the moment. But I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then finally, give you what I hope is a useful sort of typology. If you look at the African continent today, what are the different uh, types of organized violence you find when you look there? And I want to suggest there's sort of at least seven distinct forms of uh, political violence that are happening on the continent to vary, uh, varying or greater or lesser degrees. And so that's my, uh, my plan of attack. But first, I want to ask you a question um, based on that. I understand Carolyn's trying to get us all to talk a bit more to each other. Um, since 1990, if we define armed conflict or organized violence as political violence between two distinguishable armed forces that results in at least 25 fatalities in each calendar year, how many armed conflicts have there been in Africa since 1990? What's the universe of cases that I'm going to be talking about today? I'm not going to penalize wrong answers, so, and I'm not going to move on until you get the right answer. So uh, how many armed conflicts in Africa since 1990? Wow. Several. Several. <laughs> it's, that's not wrong, but more. 25. How many? 25. Higher. 100. Higher. 1,000. 1,000 is ridiculously too high. <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> significantly lower than 1,000. Right? Sorry? At least 25 battle-related deaths. So not just casualties. Lots of people get wounded and we don't even know or count. But at least 25 battle-related deaths. And terrorist actions don't count? They could be included as one-sided violence, yeah. It's going to be a long guessing game, so I'll just stop it there. It's about 400, basically. Um, I say about because it really does depend how you define them and how you go about counting them, and particularly some of the smaller ones. It's not always clear actually when that threshold of 25 people being killed has actually been crossed or not. So about 400 is what we're going to be talking about here when I talk about the sort of general numbers and, um, and theories. And I want to say two other points at the beginning before we move on. One is just about information and basically the lack of good information we have about war and conflict in Africa at the moment. Even with all our surveillance technologies and other things, in the eye of the conflict storm, we really still do not have a good idea who is doing what to who, and when, and how many people are getting killed by whom, and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of sort of fuzzy edges in our um, categories of armed conflicts here. And the second point I want to raise at the beginning, and one that I'll come back to, is that most of the armed conflict in Africa at the moment is taking place outside of the state system. So most of our sort of traditional theoretical frameworks in political science and international relations and others have sort of trained us to look at what governments and states do. The problem, or just the reality as I would think about it, is most of the violence that's taking place in Africa at the moment is happening outside of that state system. It's not really between governments and other governments. It's often not even involving government troops a lot of the time. This is taking place really between various types of non-state actors. So that's the, the two points I want to flag up at the beginning. And if you think about those 400 um, odd conflicts in a sort of more spatial sense, there's a few databases we have out there that have been trying to map all these things. Uh, there's no, I should say another thing at the beginning, there's no single database that I think has really captured all of the types of political violence that I'll, I'll talk about today. But two of the main ones to start off with, ACLED, the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, funded largely by the World Bank, has been collecting pretty good and systematic data since 1997. And you can see here um, basically where the conflict hotspots are over that period. And the other main data set that I'm going to use um, for my remarks today uh, is from the Uppsala Conflict Data Programme. 
which has been collecting information about these things since the early 1980s, and I think overall is still the best uh, conflict database we have to address these issues. And again, you'll see, I can't see, but you'll see similar patterns in terms of where the majority of armed conflicts are taking place at the moment. Now, I'm going to talk about these different um, things up there later on. If we zero in then on just more contemporary period, what's been happening in the 21st century, uh, you'll see some sort of good and bad news comes up here about the African continent. The, the big good news story is that compared to the early 1990s, southern Africa has become a lot more peaceful region. And in the 21st century, the vast majority of the conflicts we're going to talk about are happening in that sort of broad swathe from West Africa through the Sahel across to the, the Horn and the Great Lakes. And if we zoom in even more to 2010, which is the, the latest year Uppsala has updated its um, geo-reference data set, you'll see the, the news is even better. Um, not only are there a lot less conflicts than there have been at other periods, but again, they're concentrated largely in that swathe from West Africa and the Sahel across um, to the Horn. Now, that leaves us with a question. 400-ish armed conflicts since 1990. That means Africa has experienced more than its fair share if you look at it through um, population and individuals. Yeah? Roughly 1 billion Africans out of roughly 7 billion people on the planet. 400 armed conflicts in that period is far more than their fair share. Or if you look at it in terms of states, 54 African countries, about a quarter of the world's population. It's had far more than a quarter of the world's conflicts during this period. So the big question for us to think about analytically is what explains this large amount of armed conflicts? What is it that actually accounts for these? Now, I'd suggest you'll find a, a lot of, um, well, what I would call myths out there about what exactly is driving and explaining uh, these types of um, violence. I've put more detail rather than less because I understand you can have a look at the slides and keep all the, the slides subsequently. But I want to run through what I think are some of the more common myths about what we've been seeing. Uh, first one, um, Robert Kaplan's idea, um, written in the early 1990s, but still subscribed to today by quite a few people, that we're experiencing basically the African version of a post-Cold War disorder. Um, after the relative order that was imposed between the Soviet Union and US antagonisms, let's say, um, Kaplan talked about this sort of dystopian future, where after the the bipolar gloves had come off, if you like, or sorry, the, the cauldron had stopped simmering, um, there was going to be a whole lot more conflicts break out. And in Africa, to a certain extent, this proved true. In the first couple of years after the end of the Cold War, we did see a spike and a rise in the number of armed conflicts. But since then, we've seen a pretty dramatic decrease from the peak of armed conflicts in the mid-1990s uh, until where we are now. The slight bit of bad news, and again, with predictions like Kaplan, anyone predicting a dystopian future is very hard to, to basically um, uh, falsify at one level because they always keep pointing to the, the next day. And actually, in the last couple of years, since 2012, they're probably on to something again here. We have seen quite a sharp rise in armed conflict in Africa, and I'll talk about why in a bit. But so I don't think really a, a key explanation for what's gone on are really Cold War and post-Cold War dynamics. That's not really helpful in explaining Africa's wars. A second, um, I think, popular myth you'll find out there, uh, Jeffrey Gettleman, um, New York Times correspondent for East Africa and sometimes the whole of Africa, um, and sometimes other things as well. But Gettleman's written a lot about some individual um, conflicts and issues, but he's also written some sort of more general takes on what's going on. And he calls, um, calls a lot of the conflicts in Africa forever wars. Africa is suffering from uniquely protracted wars that go on forever because none of the conflict parties have an interest in ending them. Indeed, they often do well out of them, and Gettleman's chief suspects would be your warlord, factions, militias, but also some politicians that do well out of conflict politically. The problem, of course, um, is that although there is a grain of truth in this, and some actors really do do well financially and political, politically out of warfare, again, the statistics point in a different direction particularly since the late 1990s, most of Africa's armed conflicts have actually come to an end, albeit fragile and sometimes problematic ends where we get peace processes that break down and start again and break down and start again. But we've seen actually more conflicts in Africa ended by negotiated settlements in the last 15 years than ever before. So I don't think it's really useful to characterize these as really in a sort of pessimistic forever war type um, sense. 
A third popular myth you'll hear. Um, this is less from the New York Times and actually a bit more from ordinary Africans. You'll often hear that you can't understand or you can't explain what's happening in terms of wars on the continent now without understanding the colonial legacy and in particular the colonial legacy to do with the creation of arbitrary political borders on the uh, continent. These borders are either separating groups that should be together or lumping together groups that should be kept apart for different reasons whether this is based on linguistic ties, ethnic identities, religious groups, or what have you. And so there's a lot of arguments here that if only we'd have drawn the sort of um, international political borders in Africa differently, we'd have a lot less tensions and conflict between the groups there. Now, again, I think this, this is mythical in a number of uh, senses, really. Number one is that just all political borders are arbitrary. Wherever we think planet Earth came from, it certainly didn't appear with roughly 200 international political boundaries demarcated on it. Political borders are there because powerful people have the power to make them stick and enforce them. That's been the same in Africa as anywhere else in the world. In the African case though obviously those borders were initially defined largely by imperial powers but in 1964 in the Cairo Declaration the Organization of African Unity said yes they're all arbitrary, yes they're imperially imposed but actually we're going to keep them because we think it's better than opening the Pandora's box of trying to redraw these things. So that's a second problem here. And a third one is that really um, there haven't actually been that many wars in Africa out of that 400 I spoke about. There's probably less than 30 or so that are really fought over political boundaries. Most of Africa's wars are not really fought with an explicitly secessionist or territorially based agenda. There's some, and of course there are some quite um, popular important ones that are based on that, but the vast majority of African conflicts are fighting about the types of government that we have in various countries, not where the borders should be drawn. Ethnicity. It's all about tribalism. It's all about kith and kin. It's all about our ethnic identities. This you'll hear from a variety um, of different people, academics, journalists, locals as well. The idea that it's ethnicity that kills. Now there's a sort of obviously wrong version of this and a bit more nuanced correct version. The obviously wrong version is that the problem that Africa faces with its wars is one of ethnic difference. Now this is obviously wrong at a very basic level. Ethnic difference is not the problem in Africa for a number of reasons. Number one, if it was ethnic difference that was causing wars, the continent would literally never stop fighting with itself. There's literally no end to ethnic difference on the continent. Really what's happening is when ethnic differences get politicized and instrumentalized for somebody's agenda, be that a general, a politician, a warlord leader or what have you, it's the manipulation and the stereotyping of certain ethnic groups or religious identities or tribal identities that are then used in various agendas to promote political power or gain economic resources or whatever the case may be, that's really the problem. And so I, I think of it in simplistic terms as Ethnicity is not the problem, but ethnicity plus a sort of stereotypical and, and um, uh, problematic political agenda, and when politicians and others manipulate ethnic identities for their own political purposes, then we start to see more important variations of this uh, dynamic taking effect. Where it's, I think, quite accurate, though, at one level, is if you do take a snapshot, let's say it's South Sudan, end of December 2013, who is killing who in the capital city in Juba and for what reason? You can, of course, make a very good case that Nua and Dinka identities are literally the difference between life and death, depending where you live. But looking at the dynamics of how a war unfolds and who might be killing whom for various reasons once the fighting starts is not the same thing as explaining why these fights start in the first place. And so what I would say here is that while you can always find cases where ethnic identity can get you killed, if you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's not ethnic differences per se that are really driving the, uh, the conflicts. These are much more about political struggles. Resource wars is another um, common refrain you'll hear. Africa's wars are really all about the struggle for accumulation of wealth and resources. The, uh, the big usual suspects here would be either the struggle for oil wealth and control over oil, diamonds, gold, coltan, timber, 
wolframite, tantalite, all sorts of other things in there. Increasingly now trading in exotic species of flora, fauna and other things. But whatever the case may be, this is really about the accumulation of wealth and resources. This is why we see the dynamics and conflicts we do. A couple of problems here again, I think, quite similar to the ethnic case. The struggle for resources is not very good at explaining when conflicts break out. It's much better to look at and, and gives us a better understanding of the dynamics of warfare once wars have started. We can understand why people fight around particular diamond mines or why they fight around particular oil fields and the like. But these minerals and other things have always been in the ground and people don't always fight over them. Really where we see resources being connected is when they become politically consequential in the country concerned. When we start having unfair distribution of the benefits of these things or certain groups try and manipulate the resources for their own political agendas. They pass them out to their own supporters and they deny these resources to their opponents. This type of political relationship is really what it's at the heart of the matter. But again, if you take a snapshot of, let's say, the wars in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, and you look at this in sort of 2002, 2003, and 4, what do people seem to be fighting about? And what do people say they're fighting about? Well, it is a lot about who's controlling which particular coltan mine or access to the timber or gold or whatever it might be. But if you look beneath this, this is normally fighting for political reasons. The groups that are formed to fight over these resources are distinguished along political lines. And it's about the politics of what we're doing with these resources that is the uh, issue. The one exception where I think this is actually getting not really mythical, but is actually getting quite near the truth, as I'll talk about later, a lot of that 400 conflicts in Africa are to do with sort of pastoralists and nomadic versus sedentary forms of lifestyle in different parts of the continent. And at that very localized level of fighting, when we're talking about issues about cattle raiding, for example, or access to water or grazing land, that I think is the closest that we see conflict actually being about natural resources and environmental change and degradation in particular. So Resources is a, is a tricky one, but I would see overall resources are always a means to an end, not really the end in themselves. And finally, um, the last myth, I think, uh, popularized mainly by uh, Professor Paul Collier, uh, who used to work with the World Bank in the 1990s and was very influential there, now a professor um, at Oxford University in the UK. Collier's thesis was basically, again, another variant of the resources, but this was all about greedy warlords. And it wasn't actually about states and governments, but to understand Africa's wars, you needed to look at the rebels, basically, and you needed to understand why was it we were seeing so many just greedy warlord factions from the 1990s. Whereas Collier said before, you might find rebels fighting for either socialist or communist agendas or capitalist agendas if they were on that side in the Cold War. Or you might find rebels that were actually articulating alternative political reform agendas for whatever country they're fighting in. Collier says these days, you're just really, you're, that political set of grievances is not really important. And if it is there, it's just rhetoric. What these guys are really about is the search for wealth. And it's a, it's a struggle for greed and a factionalized one at that. And I think there uh, are lots of problems with these, but I'll just flag up a, a couple. Number one is no one would say that the rebels are unimportant in explaining Africa's wars, but I would make a case that normally actually understanding the regime in power in whatever state you're talking about is actually a more important place to start. And a lot more wars seem to start because of what the regimes in power do than necessarily what the rebels are concerned with. Secondly, there's all sorts of problems with really does greed actually explain why conflicts start and what we see happening in them. I'll take the sort of archetypal case of Charles Taylor, who was one of Collier's favorite warlords, who in the 1990s and beyond was sort of seen to exemplify this greedy warlord type individual. You know, Taylor was all about getting access to the diamonds, the timber, the rubber that was in Liberia, but also if they were across the border in Sierra Leone, that didn't matter. He created what was known popularly as Taylorland, which encompassed basically a whole swathe of um, Sierra Leone and its diamond mines up in the, the northeast. And that was really his sort of modus operandi. And this is how people like Collier picked this up and thought, well, this is really a struggle for wealth accumulation and greed. The problem with this, I think, is if we just think a little bit about Charles Taylor, we don't know exactly how much money he made out of diamonds and timber and rubber, but the estimates around there are at least 300 million US dollars. In which case, why doesn't he just sort of buy the Seychelles 
move to a nice desert island somewhere and enjoy the good life? Why does he really want to be president of Liberia? Why does he keep fighting for years out in the bush to take the executive mansion in Monrovia? That doesn't seem to strike me as it's all about greed. It's actually a struggle at one level for political power. He wants to be president of Liberia. And let's face it, why would you want to be president of Liberia? There are many negative or problematic reasons with that, or problematic issues with that job title. But Taylor fought you know, long and hard for that, and he succeeded. So there's a whole set of questions about really does greed actually explain what's going on or is it actually more deeply fused with the search for political power? Um, there's a lot of methodological issues I would have as well with Collier, but we can talk about those in more detail if you're interested. So if I think those are some of the key myths as to what's been driving um, conflict in Africa, what do I think are the, um, the real drivers? Unfortunately, it's not particularly exciting and it's blatantly obvious at one level, but I think we just have to go back to good old-fashioned politics and particularly governance structures. I've not studied a single armed conflict in Africa that doesn't have some connection to who's ruling, who's calling the shots, who has political power, and what are the rules they're using to actually run the show. Do they treat their political opponents and their supporters in roughly the same way and fairly, or do they basically arbitrarily use networks of patronage and client relations to basically um, support their own people and deny access to others. I think this is the key driver in most cases we're looking at. And what I would want to suggest to you is that we shift away from thinking about there are obvious causes, whether it's arbitrary borders, greedy warlords, resources, ethnicity. There's no single big ideas, I think, that are really driving all of these African wars. Instead, I think about these things now increasingly in terms of food. In fact, when I think about anything for a while, I, I tend to drift off to the subject of food rather rapidly. Um, but the more I thought about it, actually making war in Africa, there's quite a lot of similarities between making culinary dishes. There's lots of variants. It's very important what ingredients you use. It's very important how these ingredients get prepared and mixed. It's crucially important to know who's cooking this. Are you dealing with master chefs or basically novices in the kitchen? Um, there's a lot of differences here about new twists on old recipes. And so what I want to suggest is really every war that you're going to be studying or involved with in Africa, it's all a mix of ingredients that are put together. There's no single factor that's driving these things. It's a much more complex social system. And as a result, we need to think about it as having multiple ingredients to create them. But having said that, what do I think is one of the key ingredients that's been at the heart of most of these conflicts? I think it's what the African studies academics call neo-patrimonialism. I don't know, is this a word, is this a new word to any of you? Neo-patrimonialism, fantastic word. Um, I spent hours of my life figuring out what this means. In a nutshell, the African studies community has basically come to the conclusion that Africa, and particularly the African countries that have had most of the wars and civil wars, have got governance structures that they refer to as neo-patrimonial. What do they mean by that? Patrimonial forms of rule are basically where personal and charismatic traits dictate the rules of the game. So a patrimonial system is one where an individual, a charismatic individual, in this case, let's say the president or head of state, uses the office of presidential power for personal gain and for personal reasons. He makes the rules, he doesn't necessarily listen to parliament or the constitution, and so in a patrimonial system, the relationship between the patron and their clients, lower down the political hierarchy, is basically dictated according to the personal whims of the guy that's in charge. A neo-patrimonial system, though, is what happens when you fuse that good old-fashioned personal set of power relations with what these uh, academics call a facade of sort of more liberal democratic trappings. What happens when a personalized system of political power meets a more institutional system where you have things like constitutional rules and a new constitution and a parliament that is supposed to set the rules about how and when we have elections and political power. And the idea of a neo-patrimonial system is that Africa has a lot of these regimes which are precisely facing that fusion of what happens when personal informal mechanisms of power meet more institutional forms of the rule of law and political power. 
most commonly represented nowadays in the idea of a constitution with term limits for presidents and a parliament that's actually got a little bit of teeth. And so the power is not just concentrated in the president's office, but we look for power in a judiciary, parliament, the constitutional values as well. And the argument basically is that we see these sort of struggles for power in a lot of African countries, particularly the ones where we've seen most of the, the wars and problems. And so it's this struggle in neo-patrimonial systems. The sort of analytical problem we have is that it's a bit of a puzzle. What's going to win out at any given time? The personalized system of rule or the institutional forms of power? Over time, in the last 15 years or so in the African continent, it's the institutional forms of power that are much more powerful than they used to be. We've seen, for example, more and more presidents in Africa are actually leaving office, not just dying in office, but leaving office in various ways. And the reason they're doing that is because actually they can't just personally change the constitution to eradicate uh, term limits, for example. They can't just manipulate the election results. Most of them will try. And often they're very successful. Incumbents get away with a lot of fraudulent elections a lot. But increasingly, the institutional power of democratic politics is being more and more important on the continent. But sometimes it loses out to that personal system. And it's in those types of regimes that generate the most political grievances because the argument goes they basically keep power and money and resources in their own political supporters and they keep them away from their opponents. Now, where does, that, where does that leave us now? Sorry, I'm having clicker issues. It's so important it won't let me leave in this particular slide. Can we just move on? A Thank you. So I want to finish by saying where does this leave us if we look at Africa at the moment and uh, what are the types of political violence we see? I want to suggest there are basically seven different types. Start with the easy one. Um, civil wars. Good old-fashioned civil wars, meaning insurgents and rebels fighting against their own government. Not entirely, but largely and primarily in the territory of that particular country. Uh, civil wars, a couple of things to say about them. Number one, there's a lot less of them on the continent than there used to be even 10, 15 years ago. In fact, if you look at the latest Uppsala data there from 2013, there's actually only three civil wars that get above the threshold of at least 1,000 battle-related deaths in a year. The other ones, the uh, other shaded countries there, minor armed conflicts where you kill between 25 and 1,000 battle-related deaths in a, in a calendar year. But only three have crossed over the, the threshold. If you looked at the map of Africa in the late 1990s, early 2000s, you'd have found well over a dozen of these. They're getting, they're getting trickier. Um, in that they're becoming more transnationalized. A second form of conflict, or it's not really one form, but I haven't got a good or better label for this. So the, let's say the politics of labeling these types of violence, yeah, are very important. They're very political, literally, yeah. And having to admit that your country is in a civil war in public discourses, for whatever reason, seems to raise the level of seriousness to something that is really... Um, Paramount. Whereas all Uppsala is saying, the way they classify their data and the way they come to their conclusions is, as I mentioned right at the beginning, they, are, they call an armed conflict any time you can find two organized political groups. So apart from governance, the, the clue is to look for acronyms. Basically, can you find an organization? So, for example, in Nigeria, Muslims and Christians are not political organizations. They're broad religious categories. But if it's like Mend in the Delta or Boko Haram or other types of organized groups, if they then can count in their surveys of media reports and other things at least 1,000 battle-related deaths going on in Nigeria as a whole between these groups, that will cross over the threshold of civil war. So that's how they count it. But they don't really put any more sort of political emphasis on the, the label than that. They don't even classify Boko Haram as a terrorist um, yeah, again, the, I'll come back to the, the politics of one-sided violence, if you like. Yeah, the, the classifications that you get and the labels you get in the political discourses yeah, are not necessarily the same that you'll find in the databases and the academic frameworks for doing this. But I'll come back to that point in a minute. 
The second thing I think you'll find um, are what I would call wars within wars. Uh, I, don't, I just don't have a better label for this, but I, I think it, you'll see the point. If you look at Somalia, or you look at the Democratic Republic of Congo, or you look at the Sudans, um, or even Nigeria, as we just mentioned, you don't see one armed conflict going on. There's not a war in Somalia. In fact, what you've got is a whole series of interrelated armed conflicts in which sometimes the actors are different, sometimes the dynamics are very different, sometimes the methods and the political agendas are very different. But instead, what you've got going on is a whole array, a sort of Gordian knot, if you like, of different types of armed conflicts going on. But they're taking place in the same territorial space, mostly. And they're involving interrelationships that get more or less complicated between different actors and agendas. And we can think, I would encourage you to think, of these relationships at sort of four levels, the local, the national, the regional, and the global. All of Africa's wars are at once localized, nationalized, regionalized, and globalized. They're not just one of the above. They're local in as much as they're always fought, obviously, about a particular piece of land and territory, whether that's a diamond mine, an oil field, a particular town, a strategic port, whatever it might be. They're always implicated in national politics. These things never stay completely local, but the big national players always get involved in some way, shape, or form. Not always necessarily government soldiers, but they affect the national political agenda. They're often regional in that they involve support from outside states or they cross the territory of at least one or two countries. And they're often globalized. Well, they're always globalized in the sense that there is a whole lot of belief systems, networks, processes that are global in nature, not necessarily Africa-specific, that affect the dynamics of conflict on the continent. Think, for example, of the one issue of small arms and light weapons in Africa. There's a few countries that manufacture these, but I've never ever in my life heard of a rebel group or a government in Africa that said, you know, we'd love to fight a civil war, but just can't get our hands on the weaponry to do it. You know, we're full of these political grievances. If only we could find some AK-47s or some RPGs, then we could have a proper civil war. Everybody can get hold of whatever they want. And it doesn't just apply to small arms and light weapons. It applies to a whole lot of other things as well. Or belief systems, you know, at the moment we're focusing most on sort of extreme versions of Islam and notions of jihad, but also global frameworks in terms of UN peacekeeping operations, the humanitarian and development industry that's implicated in all of these conflict zones play very important roles. So we're not looking at just a war, we're looking at interrelated wars. The third thing we'll find recently, and this is actually one area of conflict that has increased in the last decade or so, uh, is good old-fashioned military coups. And for whatever reason, since the 1960s, globally speaking, Africa has been the, the epicenter of coup d'etat in the world. And again, for whatever reason, West Africa has been the epicenter of coups within Africa and within the whole world. Um, depending on what you think has been happening in Lesotho, for example, earlier this year, we're, we're up to about a dozen of these things now since 2003. Obviously, they tell us some important things about the dynamics of civil military relations. And still, they tell us some interesting things about the idea that a lot of, not necessarily even that senior military officers, think they can really change political dynamics in a country just by taking over the executive mansion. We've had some happen by accident as well. If you've been following what was going on in Mali, you can nowadays do coups without even meaning to do coups, apparently. Um, one thing to mention, the African Union has changed its position on, on responding to coups since, two, well, since the late 1990s, but when the AU was created back in 2002. The AU now takes a principled stance on condemning all forms of what it calls unconstitutional changes of government in the continent, and these include military coups. It's got into some interesting political debates in the Union about the question of whether there can be such a thing as a good coup, basically. Um, Mauritania might be one example. Mali was interesting, but there's a few others. Niger as well generated some interesting debates about this. If the military might actually put you on a course to democratization, which your previous regime didn't, for example, this has got the AU into some interesting um, situations. Libya, Egypt as well. Fourth type of conflict, uh, electoral violence. Quite a few of that 400 list of armed conflicts that I mentioned at the beginning 
are sparked and revolve around electoral politics and electoral cycles in particular African countries. Now, we've got a new data set published relatively recently here, which has looked at all elections in Africa since 1990 up to 2008, and then mapped on, obviously, what was happening in terms of political violence there. And there's good news and bad news here. There, since 1990, Africa has held about 250 national parliamentary elections now. Out of those, 20% of them, one in five, have produced targeted assassinations and violence where at least 10 people have been killed. Which means 80%, or four out of five, uh, African elections don't lead to the deaths of 10 or more people. Now, clearly, an election that leads to the death of one to nine people is not ideal in many respects. Um, but when we're thinking about you know, the big sort of news stories, the Zimbabwe's, the Cote d'Ivoire's, and other big sort of conflicts around um, electoral politics, it's important to keep this in perspective. Most of the elections that are happening in Africa are doing so without large amounts of violence connected. But there are a few countries, about a dozen or so, obviously in our cases, Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, Zimbabwe have probably been the most focused on um, here, where violence does uh, get generated and follow the electoral cycle. Their conclusions, obviously, most of it takes place well before polling day. The intimidation and violence is best done well before you actually get to the, the voting polls. Nearly half of the countries in the database, electoral violence is a recurring problem. And this is really the big problem for electoral violence is once it starts and takes hold in a country, it seems very difficult to actually stop it. The incumbent is usually the perpetrator of the vast majority of the violence. And if you're interested, presidential elections seem to be slightly but not massively more violent than the more um, legislative ones. Fifth is non-state armed conflicts. Remember I said right at the beginning, one of the big things to remember about warfare in Africa is that most of it takes place outside of or on the edges of Africa's state system. And by non-state armed conflicts, again I'm following the Uppsala program here, organized violence which produces fatalities, at least 25 battle-related deaths in this case, but does not involve troops of a recognized government. So the types of things we're talking about here are when um, different clans or different sub-clans fight one another in Somalia. I mean, remember, by definition, from 1991 till late 2012, Somalia had no central government and had no government soldiers, yet it was hardly a sort of peaceful paradise. All the sorts of fighting there is what Uppsala would call non-state armed conflicts. Now, if you look at those, it's interesting to note a few things about them. Out of the 400, I would say they account for about 260 to 270 of the conflicts on the continent are of these non-state variety. And if you look at the stats there, I think it's very interesting. Nearly 80% of all fatalities from these non-state conflicts come from just five, now six, countries. DR Congo, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Somalia, and obviously it was just Sudan, but now Sudan and South Sudan. So that's really important. Out of 270-odd armed conflicts of the non-state variety, 80% of the fatalities are occurring in just six countries. And then depending how you look at it, that's good or bad news. It means a lot of the continent is actually free from these types of problems. But if you happen to be working in or on DR Congo, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Somalia, or the Sudans, a majority of your headaches are going to be of this non-state variety. The other worrying sign about these is that unlike civil wars and the more traditional forms of conflict, which have gone down dramatically, non-state armed conflicts have basically stayed the same the whole time we've tracked them. The data we have only goes back to uh, 1989, but from 1989 till about now, 2013-ish, the levels of non-state armed conflicts, they fluctuated uh, obviously a bit year to year, but they've stayed at pretty constant levels, largely because they've stayed at pretty constant levels in these particular countries. You mentioned terrorism before, and this is where we get um, closest to it. The, the sixth type of violence I want to flag up is what Uppsala refers to as one-sided violence. Uppsala, in their um, data project, they don't use the word terrorism at all. They don't use the label um, of terrorist groups. Instead, they talk about one-sided violence, which, as they define it here, use of armed force by the government of a state or by a formally organized group against civilians and non-combatants, which results in at least 25 deaths. This does not include extrajudicial killings in custody. Now, if we take that, this is the idea that 
You remember I said earlier, fatalities were battle-related deaths. All the fatalities we were talking about in civil wars and the armed conflict data are battle-related. That means there has to be a battle. And a battle means you need at least two groups that are engaged in combat with one another. And the battle can be very one-sided. One side could be rubbish and one side could be very good. But there's still an attempt to engage in combat. What they're talking about here is when we don't have battles, we have massacres. We have one side using the violence, and civilians and non-combatants are basically suffer the consequences. Now, sometimes this takes place in the context of armed conflict and civil wars. This could be the killing of POWs. It could be the massacre of civilians, deliberately or, or otherwise. Or it could be what we're often referred to as terrorist incidents. That would be included in here. Now, if you look at the incidents of one-sided violence in the last 20 years on the continent, I think you see some very interesting things come out. There's roughly 6,000 one-sided violence events in that time. Some of them are very large, basically the biggest being the Rwandan genocide and the period there in 1994. And in that, about 600, according to Uppsala at least, 634,000 civilians have been killed. Of that total, 500,000 is the number they give for the Rwandan genocide. And I think that's a very conservative estimate, but they are generally conservative when it comes to these things at Uppsala. But if you think of 500,000 out of 634,000 have taken place in 1994 in Rwanda, you'll see again how skewed this is by the, the genocide. Those episodes have taken place in 31 different African countries. But amazingly, I think, 97.4% of all these massacres have taken place in just six states. Rwanda, which is by far the biggest because of the genocide, DR Congo, Sudan, and now South Sudan as well, Liberia, Burundi, and Uganda. And I think that's very important to remember when we're talking about atrocities in Africa generally. And you know, the vast majority of these have been happening in a relatively small number of places. There are 104 different perpetrator groups that committed these atrocities. 28 African governments were responsible for 85% of the total fatalities. 76 of the perpetrator groups were non-state actors. If you're interested, the non-state um, winners, if you like, um, uh, Laurent Kabila's um, God, AFDL in DR Congo, the Armed Forces for the Liberation of, uh, of Zaire slash Congo, they killed the most civilians. Charles Taylor's National Patriotic Front in Liberia uh, was the second biggest non-state perpetrator. And the Lord's Resistance Army in northern Uganda and around CAR, DRC, and South Sudan are the third biggest non-state actors. The vast majority are in the 1990s. Um, and this is largely good news. These are reducing. But if we take a snapshot of where we are now, and I suppose back to your Nigeria point as well. Uh, this is from the Political Instability Task Force, initially started up um, in the early 1990s, uh, CIA and a bunch of academics, largely at George Mason University here, uh, created this Political Instability Task Force, basically to try and predict, two years ahead of time, instances of state failure. And one of the things they've been looking at lately is atrocities. And from January 2013 to February 2014, you'll see where the atrocities have been occurring in Africa. And you know it's pretty stark. Nigeria has been seeing far more than anyone else. And that, to go to your question earlier, that's not so much to do with the Niger Delta conflict, which is relatively small at the moment. The vast majority here are happening up in the north and the northeast. Um, finally, livelihood struggles. Again, there's probably a better label for this, but I don't have one. Um, what am I getting at here? Very localized struggles, normally over access to environmental issues, let's say. Access to land, whether that's for agricultural purposes or grazing. Access to water or other local resources. A lot of the time, <coughs> excuse me, these conflicts take the dynamic of sort of sedentary farming communities versus herding. Communities. A lot of these uh, conflicts revolve around cattle raiding, for example. Um, but cattle raiding with AK-47s, as I put it there. A lot of um, communities, particularly, let's say, in uh, areas of South Sudan and Sudan, particularly around the Abyei region, which has become very 
controversial in recent years. You know, cattle raiding has always been an important part of society and life there, not just for proving your, you know, your transition from a boy to a man and to a warrior, but also for various types of, like, <laughs> um, let's say, economic and resource-related aspects to do with your community. But whereas traditionally these things took place and relatively few people were killed, when you add into this a sort of admixture of small arms and light weapons, you're now seeing cattle raiding wars in South Sudan that are killing hundreds of people at a time. Why is this? Well, they're being brought on and exacerbated by a couple of major factors. Demographic factors, populations are increasing dramatically in these areas, and environmental stresses are also causing part of the problem. I haven't got detailed here, but if you look at... Um, Lake Chad and the Lake Chad Basin, for example, or Lake Turkana um, between Ethiopia and Kenya, these water sources are literally shrinking. And over the last 20, 30 years or so, they've been shrinking by tens of kilometers in some cases. And as a result, the pastoralist communities and the nomadic communities that have always grazed along these particular water courses are moving in different directions and coming into conflict with the others that are there. Add to that, in a lot of these places, Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, in the hinterlands, there's been a breakdown of all sorts of traditional forms of governance and authority structures. And a lot of young youths, basically, are taking matters into their own hands to uh, change a lot of the power structures there. And that's where I'll leave it. So hopefully there's a lot of information that you're going to talk about more over the next few days, but hopefully that's a reasonable bird's-eye view account of what's happening.